Uh, it is an honor for me also to be here with you. And um, I will try now to share my slides. Let's see. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So um, please stop me if for some reason you don't hear me uh, anymore. And so it, it's my pleasure to share with you what we believe are the priorities for advanced breast cancer in um, in, uh, in, in the, the year that we are living and also um, discuss with you what, what we are trying to do with the Advanced Breast Cancer Global Alliance. So these are my disclosures. And um, just a, a very simple description of what is metastatic or advanced breast cancer uh, and a little bit of clarification why sometimes we use metastatic and sometimes we use the word advanced. So this is a, a description of breast cancer. And in the left part, you see what we call early stage breast cancer. This is when the disease is limited to the breast and to the axilla, which is a continuation of the breast. And it can be lymph node negative or positive, and that divides between stage one, two, or three. And then there is the advanced stage when the disease has left the part of the breast and the axilla and has spread to other organs of, of the body, sometimes also called stage four uh, breast cancer. And of course, what we want is to try to avoid that what is that uh, diagnosed early uh, uh, goes to the advanced stage. A big difference is that early stage breast cancer is potentially curable, while for the moment, the majority of stage four or advanced breast cancer is incurable, but treatable. So uh, the a disease can be diagnosed already at the stage four. In the developed countries, this is more or less 10 to 15% of cases. But in the low middle income countries, uh, this may go up to 60%, sometimes even more. And why does the cancer become metastatic? It's because the cancer cell that you see here in green has several new capacities. And one of these capacities is to invade the blood vessels and so leave the part where the tumor where she is in the breast and enter the blood vessel and go to other parts of the body. And then in those other parts of the body, uh, the, the cancer cell may be dormant, may be asleep for several years. And then for some reasons that we don't understand completely, it starts to grow again and gives what we call metastasis, which is small tumors, all children of the big tumor that appear in other parts of the body. So why did we decide to use the, the word advanced breast cancer instead of metastatic? Because we wanted to include two different situations. So the situation on your right is the one that I explained, metastatic breast cancer. So the one that has spread to distant sites of the body. And the situation on your left is what we call inoperable locally advanced breast cancer. So it is very large locally. It is not possible to operate, but it has not yet gone to other organs of the body. And so when we speak about advanced breast cancer, uh, sometimes we mean both, other times we mean mostly metastatic. So uh, 
what are the goals of treatment of, of this stage of the disease? Obviously, we want to improve survival, so meaning the duration of life. But we want, also want to delay the progression, to have a durable response, to control the symptoms, and to improve or maintain quality of life. So this balance between quantity and quality of life is very important when we decide treatments for this uh, disease. And of course, our goal is that one day we can call this a, really a chronic disease. Understanding that a chronic disease means that you can live several years, like decades, with this disease. So why do we need to focus on this stage of breast cancer? Why is so important? So what you see here is a graphic of mortality and it shows UK and USA, but it is the same for Greece and for Portugal and for all uh, the developed countries. Since the 90s, so since the year 90s, we start to see this very uh, important decrease in mortality. And we have not seen a decrease in incidence. So we, on the contrary, we have more and more cases, but the mortality keeps going down. Why is this? So there are two main reasons. We started about the years, the 70s and the 80s to do screening and early diagnosis and to speak about breast cancer like you are doing today. And education, advocacy leads also to better screening and early diagnosis and early diagnosis leads to less mortality. And also about the 70s and 80s, we developed new treatments such as chemotherapy and tamoxifen, and these had a huge impact in the mortality. Now, when we look at the evolution for advanced breast cancer that you can see in the graphic on, your, on, the, on the right, there are many lines there, but they are all one after the other. And in the bottom, um, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, but in the bottom, you see the numbers. The medium survival from 2008 to 2013 has been more or less three years. So not a huge improvement. And in the graphic uh, uh, on the left, up, upper left, you see that in 10 years, well, because this was a report that the Alliance did between 2005 and 2015, uh, the percentage of patients alive at five years changed only from 23 to 25. So not a huge evolution uh, in 10 years time. And then there is also a difference between what we call the novo metastatic, so the one that is diagnosed already as metastatic disease, and the one that was diagnosed early, was treated, and then many years after uh, uh, appear as recurrent metastatic. So in the, the novo that has never seen any treatment, the medium survival is about five years. For the recurrent is around the three years that we saw. And this is because we use a lot of the best drugs or the best treatments, we use it in the early setting. Now, also something else that we see on your left, you see a, two very important publications that are available online and you can read and I advise you to read. And this was done many years ago in 2006, between the 2003 and 2006. And what we saw is that the women that had advanced breast cancer felt abandoned, felt alone, and also felt guilty thinking that it was their fault that the disease had come back. And this is why we created the Global Alliance. But when we fast forward 10 years and we go to 2016, where we repeated the survey, we see that there is an improvement, but still a very large percentage of patients still feel isolated and still feel uh, that they don't have enough support. So there's still a lot of work to be done. 
<clears throat> so when we look at this situation, we thought, how can we change this? And the, the way we decided was to create a global alliance connecting all types of partners who want to work for the good of uh, the patients with this disease. So the, the words that define the work of the Alliance is collaboration and sharing. So it is not just a, it's not just a group of patient uh, organizations, it is a group of all types of partners. So there are health professionals, there are patient organizations, there are also commercial organizations, policy makers, so all types of organizations that want to work together. And we share resources, and I'll show you some of the resources that we have. And uh, as you know, you are a member of the Alliance, so you have been sharing some of the uh, projects and uh, resources that, that we have. So the first thing we did all together was exactly to define the priorities. And this is the ABC Global Charter that defined 10 goals for this decade that we are living. It exists in many languages, including Greek. So you can go to the website and, and have it. And it, what I will do now for the rest of the talk, I will take some of these uh, objectives and goals and show you why they are important and what we are doing. But this is the definition, together with patients, of course, of what we want to change in the advanced breast cancer setting. Very important for the Alliance is to integrate always the patient's perspective. So, as I showed you, the priorities should be defined together. We also should define together the goals of treatment. And I showed you that this is a balance between quantity and quality of life. And this balance is very personal, very individual, and every patient will decide differently. We also need to define toxicity and toxicity must be defined. Uh, what is acceptable must be defined by the patient. Define which endpoint? So what do we aim to achieve when we do clinical trials? What is, what is most important for the patient? Because not everything, I will not have the time to go into these details, but not everything that you see presented in a conference is actually meaningful or very, very important for the patient. Um, and we can discuss later what is progression, free survival, what does it mean, and what is overall survival. And then we have also to improve communication and awareness, education, and very importantly, to fight the stigma that still goes with this disease. So let's move to uh, the individual, uh, individual goals. So one of the goals that we defined was to improve the quality of data. So epidemiology, what do we know about this disease? And we have a big problem because we don't know how many metastatic breast cancer patients exist. So when we look at the statistics, we know how many cases of breast cancer are diagnosed per year. We know that now is about 2.2 million cases per year. <clears throat> and then uh, there are also mortality data. We know that about 600,000, so or more than half a million, uh, mostly women, also some men, but mostly women, die with this disease uh, every year. But we do not know how many are living with this disease, because the other thing that we have in the statistics is what they call prevalence. So meaning people who had the disease in the last five years and are still alive. And this includes all the survivors as well as all the metastatic patients. And we know that this is almost 8 million uh, people around the world, mostly women, 99% women, but we don't know how many of them are actually the metastatic cancers. So what we are doing, we are working together with this organization that it's called IARC, and this organization is responsible for the statistics of cancer, and we are trying to change 
the way cancer registries are done because the cancer registries, they register diagnosis and death, but they do not register relapse. So we don't know when someone has relapsed and we cannot count those that are living with this disease. So this is a, uh, one of the projects of the Alliance. The other goals that I, I added here, three of the goals that are very much together. So it's improve uh, what is important. So what we call the outcomes for the patients, improve the survival. We want at least to double the survival and improve the quality of life. And very linked to this, make sure that metastatic patients are treated by a multidisciplinary specialized team. So the first thing that we did was to develop high quality guidelines. And the reason to do that is that we know from the early breast cancer setting that treating treatment according to guidelines improves survival. And so we do not want people to continue to treat what we sometimes call eminence-based medicine. So this is of course a kind of a joke, but it's those people who say, in my experience, what I know better, no, we need to use the available data. So what we call evidence-based uh, medicine. And so we need to treat according to high quality uh, guidelines. This is what changed also in the early setting. And the other thing that has changed is the possibility to be treated by a multidisciplinary team. So uh, this is one of the major uh, uh, events that the, that the Alliance organizes, which is the Consensus Conference for Advanced Breast Cancer. And we will have our seventh conference next year in Lisbon. Hopefully, if COVID allow us, we will do it face to face. And I hope that you can come uh, to be with us. Now, other things that we are doing in this uh, area, uh, you know that we use measurements of quality of life, but the quality of life tools that exist, they were all developed for early breast cancer. There is no specific quality of life tool for metastatic disease. So one of the things the Alliance is doing together with this group that it's a cooperative group called EORTC, we are developing the first specific quality of life tool for metastatic disease. The same in terms of quality of care. So you know that we, Europadona, for example, has been fighting for certification of breast units in Europe. How do we certify a breast unit? We verify the quality of care. And to do that, there are things that we call quality indicators. And these quality indicators have been developed exclusively for early breast cancer. So what the Alliance has done was to develop the quality indicators for metastatic disease. And we have finalized this work and it's now going to be published and it's going to be implemented in the certification process. So now uh, in the very near future, all the breast units or breast centers will have to have good quality of care for both early and metastatic breast cancer. So one of the major problems in the metastatic disease is in this, um, it is what is in this picture. We call it tumor resistance. So I'll try to explain very briefly. We start in the left part. So that what you see there is the tumor and you see that the tumor has different cells. This is what we call heterogeneity. So not all the cells of the tumor are the same. We provide a treatment and then usually there is a response and the tumor becomes smaller. But I usually say that tumor cells are very intelligent so they find a way to escape. So even if you continue to give the treatment, they will escape and find a way to grow and to become even more uh, aggressive. So this is what we call resistance. And so the tumor grows and becomes even more complex with even more different cells. So what we need to do there is we need to give another treatment 
and hopefully get a good response. So this highlights that we need to have access to several types or as we call it, several lines of treatment to be able to improve the survival and the quality of life. So this is also linked to one another of, uh, of the goals of the Alliance is that we want to ensure that all metastatic patients have access to all these treatments regardless of their ability to pay. So we know, unfortunately, that there are many inequalities in access to care. What you see there is a very interesting graphic. It's an old graphic, but it, it's still very much the same today. You see all those dots with different colors. Each of them is a country. And you see, for example, and that for example, there is a, a group of red dots that has lower mortality. And we know that all those red dots are actually the Eastern European countries where there is less access to treatments. So um, it is very clear that the access to care is directly linked to the outcome. And this is something the politicians must all of them be very much aware. But when we talk of inequalities, it's not just expensive medicine. It's also all the other things we need to treat cancer properly. Pathology is very uneven around the world. Uh, in the top, you see also radiotherapy, also very uneven. For example, I was born in Africa. Many people don't know, but I was born in Africa. And in my country, the first radiotherapy machine was introduced in 2019. So you see very recently only. And there are other very inexpensive medicines that we also don't have equal access. And something very important is access to morphine, which is for pain control. And you see here a graphic of the world, totally different. This is according to availability of morphine. And you see that there is an exaggeration in uh, uh, America and Australia and some parts of Europe. And then there is almost no access in South America, in Africa and in Asia. And this is linked to something very terrible, which is death in pain. So even if we cannot avoid death all the time, but we can and we should avoid pain. And this is something also the Alliance is fighting around the world. So how do we address the inequalities? There are many things and for lack of time, I'm not going to go into all of them, but again, the crucial role of guidelines, also making sure that metastatic patients are not forgotten in major initiatives. And I'll show you that develop and share resources with difficult populations like rural populations, populations that are um, less economic uh, capacities, uh, less um, social capacities, develop and also share resources with low middle income country and the part of awareness and fighting stigma. So currently there are three initiatives that are crucial for cancer patients. One is Europe's Beating Cancer Plan that I know you will be also talking about that. The other one may be less known is that the Lancet is issuing what we call a Lancet Breast Cancer Commission. And these are very important because they are um, promoted with the policymakers and the politicians. And the WHO, is developing the Global Breast Cancer Initiative. So what we are doing because we are contributing for the three initiatives is making sure they do not forget the needs of metastatic uh, patients. And something else we've been fighting together all over uh, the world in, 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 in every country is the way the reimbursement is, is done. In many countries, the reimbursement has not evolved with science. And so the reimbursement rules do not facilitate oral treatment, do not facilitate shorter treatments of radiotherapy. 
and we need to change these. So they need to be patient centered and not just centered in the money. So moving on in terms of improving communication, we know you know that doctors, they don't have a lot of training in communication. So some of us are good communicators, but others not really. And then of course, that is a problem when talking to patients. So what we've been trying to do is all over the world to develop communication training for both healthcare professionals, but also for patients and patients advocates who like to learn how to better communicate. And also, of course, sharing of information using webinars and many other things that are available and I don't have the time now to go through, but I'll, I'll invite you to go to our website and to see some of the things that are free of charge and that you can take, translate and use in your country. And this will help you uh, find ways to help those patients living with metastatic disease that have less resources. Now, uh, last two points. One of them is related to our professional life. So one of the important things is to be able to continue to work. If you like work in your professional life is important, then you need to be able to continue to work. But most of the cancer patients and even the survivors, we need flexibility in the, in the work setting. So um, there is a huge problem with cancer that is the indirect cost. So people who stop working and who don't produce anymore. And of course, if you stop working, you have financial problems. And this is a problem for patients and for families. And it's also bad psychologically speaking. And we have many data showing this. Um, so for example, we know that about 75% of, of uh, patients that were diagnosed with metastatic disease had to change their employment and 70% had a decrease in the income. So what we've been trying to fight is to have a change in the work-related laws to be able to work part-time, to be able to work from home like we learn in the pandemic and to have flexible timetables. And I, I will really would like to show you this uh, video, but because it is a little bit long and I don't have much time, I didn't include it here, but I'll advise you to go to our website. There is a short film of about four minutes with testimonies from women of what happened in their professional life and what we can do to help them continue uh, with the, the, their professional life. And there is also a wall of stories where you can add your own story uh, of other examples, some good examples, some not so good, unfortunately. And finally, uh, the fight against the stigma and isolation that so many of these patients still feel. And this leads us to our initial uh, awareness campaign that was called I Am Advanced Breast Cancer. And I will show you now the video because this is only one minute and a half. And this is how I will end uh, my talk because I think the women in the film explain much more, uh, much better than I could explain. I just hope technology will help me and that you are able to see uh, the little movie that I show you. I'm a project manager at King's College London. Dan saya adalah pengidap. I'm a primary school teacher. Soy educadora de niños. I uh, work for Ernst and Young as senior.
was a mixed bag, bag of emotions. It was kind of exciting because normality was coming back, but it was also very scary because can I do this now? Am I capable? What What is my body going to allow me to do? They said to me, you have to, to leave. Semasa mula-mula saya nak datang kerja sini, dia kata minta maaf ya kalau saya katakan uh, pesakit kanser ni uh, last kali akan mati. I experience physical and emotional breakdowns. I needed the job, I needed the finance, the salary to help me to pay my bills, my treatments. I needed at least that. I don't know how to find a job that will meet me where I am. I would recommend to any employer to sit with the with the individual, identify the challenges, and address the needs. Living or working with advanced breast cancer, you're more than capable of doing the job with just a little bit of flexibility. Porque el cáncer no nos quita la capacidad de pensar, ni de actuar, ni de hacer lo que sabemos hacer. Potentially, we could have a long time left working. So don't write us off. It is not over until it is over. Um, thank you very much for your speech. Um, maybe we have a time for a short question. Is there any question? Or some Can you hear us, Dr. Cardozo? Yes, I I can. Uh, just a short comment. Uh, since we know that you have to leave the, the session, uh, we would like to thank you very much for your presence here because your work in the field of metastatic breast cancer um, has been motivating for all of us uh, throughout Europe in order to work harder, speak louder, and try to do our best uh, for metastatic breast cancer. Uh, patients. So we would really like to thank you for all the work that you have done throughout uh, the years. And um, uh, just to tell you that your work has been really inspiring for all of us. And uh, I talk on behalf of all of us here uh, of uh, Hellenic Association of Women with Breast Cancer. Uh, and we follow the, the, the path that you have created. Thank you so much. Thank you. But uh, I think the real heroes are the patients and also i would like to thank you for for working in the in the field together with patients so um i'm very passionate and i really want to change uh, the lives of these patients but we can only we can only do it together so um thank you also for the work that you do and i'm i'm happy to stay a little bit more if anyone has questions or suggestions. So please feel free. Um, as an oncologist, I would like also to thank you for, for all your work and uh, for all your initiatives that uh, I believe changed the world we see breast cancer. Um, a suggestion that I would have sitting over here and watching all of you is that there are not men in this room. Why? <laughs> Maybe you should be more inclusive. What do you think? Have you seen that men um, are really 
with the women going through this disease? Dr. Cardozo? Well, I think that men, they, they, have, they are more present when the disease is metastatic, I think. Uh, so from, from what I have seen, the most of the men are beside the women, not all. And it depends also on the country. We, we still see some terrible stories of uh, men that just abandon their women in, their ho in the hospital because they are dying with the disease. But I think that the majority of, of men remain by the side of, of the, their wives uh, or friends or family if, if they have metastatic disease. I think you are also aware that in the early breast cancer setting, that is not exactly the case. A lot of women uh, get divorced after a diagnosis of breast cancer. Uh, and that is, of course, extremely sad. And this is something we need to perhaps do something about it through education. Would you like to continue? No, I stopped listening. I didn't know that if you were listening to me or yes, not. Yes, 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 we, we did. I think it's definitely something that uh, you in the Alliance and uh, here in Greece, we should really um, upscale because breast cancer is not only about women. It's not only about a woman patient. It's not only about a woman doctor. Uh, it's, uh, it's about men also. I think uh, Mrs. Michalopoulou would like to add something. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω την κυρία Καρδόζο. Θα σας παρακολουθήσω να κάνετε μετάφραση γιατί δεν μπορώ να... Να ευχαριστήσω ιδιαίτερα την κυρία Καρδόζο για την απίστευτα, πολύ κατατοπιστική ομιλία σας. Και θα ήθελα στην ουσία εδώ να... Κάνω ένα κάλεσμα στις γυναίκες που είναι με μεταστατικό ή προχωρημένο καρκίνο μαστού μέσα από τη δικιά της ομιλία αλλά και τις ομιλίες που θα ακολουθήσουν. Γιατί οι γυναίκες με καρκίνο μαστού, μιλάω για την Ελλάδα, έχουν την εντύπωση ότι η σύλλογη άλμα ζωής δεν είναι για το μεταστατικό καρκίνο ή ότι αν έρθουν θα στεναχωρήσουν τις γυναίκες με πρόημο καρκίνο ή θα τις φοβήσουν. Δεν είναι όμως έτσι. Οι γυναίκες έχουμε ανάγκη την υποστήριξη και στο άλμα ζωής υπάρχουν και δομές που μπορούν να βοηθήσουν τις μεταστατικές γυναίκες. Είναι σημαντικό να είναι και αυτές σε μια κοινότητα που μοιραζόμαστε τα προβλήματα και είναι ένα απίστευτο σπουδαίο παράδειγμα τι σημαίνει να έχει μετάσταση και να προχωράς τη ζωή σου με μία προοπτική. Είναι ένα θάρρος, ένα δείγμα, ένα παράδειγμα για όλους μας. Είναι πηγή έμπνευση αυτές οι γυναίκες. Mm -hmm. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Yeah. I think you have heard uh, Dr. Cardozo. Do you need me to translate, yeah. or I think you? No, you heard I think I, I heard the tr uh, translation. Mm -hmm. So yes, you are very right that uh, sometimes and for many years, the advocacy groups have forgotten about metastatic patients, and when we started this in the 2006, this is one of the things these patients said. They said, I am lost in the pink movement. I don't feel that it speaks for me. And, but I have to tell you that in these last 10 years, the majority of patient advocacy groups have changed. They now almost all have resources for metastatic patients. And sometimes these resources have to be different because the situation is different. And of course, every patient group has to continue to fight for screening 
an early diagnosis because if you have an early diagnosis, the probability of having metastasis is lower. But simultaneously, you have to fight for those who have metastatic disease as well. And sometimes those who had early disease feel very scared when they face a metastatic uh, patient because they feel I can become one. And so what we need is to overcome this uh, problem and say, okay, not everybody has metastasis, about 20% to 30%, depending on the country, but everybody has similar problems. So for example, the problem I told you about work, flexibility at work, is something important for metastatic patients, but also for survivors, okay? And um, other things that are very common, for example, uh, I don't know if in your meeting you will discuss about side effects, but there is something called oncobrain, which is changes in memory and concentration because of both chemotherapy and endocrine therapy that is also common to metastatic patients and survivors. So what I suggest is that you take subjects that are important for both and you fight together, and then that you have separate resources for things that are really different between one group and the other. But I, I am very happy with the patient advocacy movement around the world because you have changed and you have been embracing the metastatic patients. Yes, thank you very much. You are, you are an inspiration. Um, thank you, thank you. Thank you.